Okay, welcome. Uh, this is the first lecture in the uh, Digital Systems Design course, EE 3563. I'm Dr. Paul Morton. Most of you know me. Uh, for those of you who don't, I'm, I'll go through my, uh, I'll do a quick introduction right now, and then I'm going to talk about the course. We're going to go over the syllabus, uh, talk about the labs, talk about a number of things. Uh, probably won't get into uh, much actual uh, course detail. Uh, until later. All right, so first off, um, the, uh, the uh, so my history, or my background. So, so I uh, went to Purdue as an undergrad many years ago, uh, and then uh, after Purdue, I was in ROTC, so I went in the uh, Army, I went to flight school, went to Vietnam, flew helicopters, uh, did Airborne Ranger, Infantry Officer Basic, all that. And, uh, and then when I came back from Vietnam, I did about another 10 months, and I separated from the Army uh, and uh, went to the University of Missouri uh, and uh, spent a year thinking about being a full-time Christian worker and then started graduate school. Uh, I got my master's uh, in electrical engineering, my PhD in electrical engineering. At least I was working on it. And then what happened was I uh, applied to medical school. I got into medical school, but I continued to work on my thesis and uh, in May of uh, uh, the year I graduated from medical school, uh, I graduated from medical school in May, and then in December I got my PhD. Um, so I basically wrote my thesis as an intern. Um, so I did my residency at Wash U, and then I joined the Air Force. I went in the Air Force as a physician, uh, went to a small base for a couple years where they killed me. I worked 120 hour weeks delivering babies, uh, didn't do any engineering during that time. Uh, and then I uh, went to Wright Pat, where I did engineering three days a week and medicine two days a week for nine years. It was great. Then I came down here, did a, another year of engineering, and then I went over to the med center and did uh, and be, and became the chairman of the of the OBGYN department for nine years. Uh, when I retired from the Air Force in '04, I went into private practice for nine years uh, uh, here in San Antonio, and. Uh, and uh, during that time, even before that time, even while I was still uh, active duty, uh, I started. Uh, I was asked to teach uh, logic design here at UTSA, and I started doing that. I think in 2001, um, and I taught that uh, ever since. Basically, uh, there was maybe one or two semesters where I didn't teach it somewhere in there. Um, but when I went into private practice, I started. Uh, I, they asked me to come back and teach again, so I did, and then. Uh, over time, uh, I was asked if I could teach some more courses. In my last year in private practice, I taught two courses, which was almost full-time, uh, and did my full-time practice, and uh, was the medical director of a weight loss clinic and worked there on weekends, and uh, that was kind of busy. Uh, but uh, in, 2000, in 2013, I uh, closed my practice, pretty much retired from medicine, uh, although I still do have my license, but I don't see, haven't seen patients for, um, I guess, for a little over a year, coming up on two years. Um, so, um, or maybe just a year, I don't know. Anyway, um, I really enjoy teaching. I do it because I like it. I like to interact with you guys, and, um, and I really want to uh, motivate you to learn this material. I see that as part of my job. Uh, I know some students are already motivated; they're fired up, ready to learn, and uh, you know that's great. They're fun to have. I know some of you probably just you're taking the course because you have to. You're not that interested, um, but I just I, I'm gonna. My, it's gonna be my goal to motivate you to get excited about this course. I think we have a good course prepared for you. Uh, the labs are, I think interesting. I think you'll enjoy working with this Nexus 4 board. It's a great little board. Uh, I think you'll begin to appreciate the incredible power. The truth is we're, we're only going to barely scratch the surface because learning learning Verilog is, is a little bit of a challenging task and, um, and, uh, and it's going to take some effort to do it. But you cannot learn Verilog without writing and running on hardware your code. And this is a, it, it, it looks a lot like C, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't taste like C. It, it turns out it's, it's just very different because you're not, you're not writing a program 
that's going to be executed step one, step two, step three. You're writing hardware that's going to be on and working continually. And so many of the things you write in your code will be happening all at the same time. And in order to make any sense out of it, you generally have to create a state machine and actually run your create your hardware as a state machine. And that, that is that is you that is why we taught you about state machines in logic design. And that's why state machines are so important. Um, okay, that and state machine, same, same as sequential design. Uh, so we'll, we'll, you will directly apply everything you learned in logic design in this course. And the, first, the book we're going to use is the same book, same author, or at least some of the same authors that wrote uh, the, the logic design text, Roth. But uh, we'll go through that in just a minute. So let me, let me, uh, let me move on here. I want to keep things rolling. And uh, I'm going to shrink this down. And then I'm going to talk about the syllabus a little bit. So here's the syllabus. Um, 3563, fall 2020. And uh, it's here's the kind of the content. I, I'm going to scroll through this and mention a few things. Um, so first off, this talks a little bit about the fact that Part of the course is is uh, online, fully online asynchronous. That's the lecture part. Part of the course is face to face. But our laboratory part of the course, you can do once you pick up your hardware one time. You sign out your board, and at the end of the course, turn it back in. Those are the only two times you would really have to come to the laboratory. But many of you will probably need help. Some of you will need help. Uh, getting Vivado on your machine. Uh, and we do already have Vivado on the computers. The lab we use is the second floor uh, engineering building lab, the 020422. You can have 14 people in that lab, 14 students in that lab at any one time. When uh, the 15th person comes, then they have to wait until somebody leaves. Right now, we have as many as 30 assigned to the lab. So we're going to see how this works. I, my hope is that mo many of you can work from home. But if you need to come to lab, you're welcome. Just remember that uh, once we have 14 people in the room, anybody else is going to have to wait. So, uh, you know, so we do want you to be efficient. Uh, if, if we're continually backed up in our labs, then my plan is to cut the lab times in half and schedule half the students to come at the beginning and half to come at the middle time. And, and We'll just make the labs instead of three hours and basically an hour and a half, or I guess really an hour twenty, whatever it is. Anyway, instead of three hours, and generally for most things that will be sufficient. Uh, but again, all the more reason why you need to get Vivado downloaded on your computer, um, and you should have a decent laptop, not an Apple. You should have uh, you know an IBM compatible laptop, uh, and when we do a Zoom help sessions. And office hours, I really would like you to have a working camera. So if your laptop's got a busted camera, spend 15 bucks and get a and get a webcam. Um, okay, um, so you do not have to buy this Nexus 4 board. Uh, you just have to sign it out and turn it back in. If you don't turn it back in, I'll give you an incomplete until you turn in the board. Um, you will also get uh, you also have to do at least 10 of the labs and the final project in order to get a grade in the course if you don't do those I'll consider it incomplete and uh, you'll have to finish that work to get a grade obviously if you don't finish that work you'll just get an F you have one year to complete it um, that's actually that may sound harsh but it's actually a really good deal because if you go because really that's a bastardized use of incomplete it's not really how you're supposed to use it but I do that so you don't have to register for the course again. So let's say you, you went through the course, you missed two labs, and you didn't do your project. So normally you'd get an F. And if you wanted to, then you would have to register for the course again, pay the tuition again, and do the whole course over. But with the incomplete, all you have to do is make up the two labs and do your final project, and then you get a grade in the course, whatever grade you would have earned with those additional points. Uh, and I don't penalize you. So if you we're earning an A and you just needed to finish two labs in your final project and you did okay on them, then you'd get an A. Uh, if you were doing C work, then you'd get a C. But whatever. But uh, but 
so that's really a golden handshake, and I do that to be nice. Uh, one of these days, the university will probably tell me I can't do it anymore, but right now they, that has not happened. So uh, they seem they kind of tolerate it. And uh, so it's, it's a good deal for you, though, because it means you don't have to pay again. Now, obviously, if you're dropping out of engineering, you don't care, then that's fine. Your incomplete will convert to an F, and you don't have to do the work. So it's just like you got an F. Uh, but you have a year to do the work and get a grade if you want. And uh, I certainly encourage you to do that. But you cannot do your work. Uh, there are cutoff dates on the work. And so once you miss those dates, you're going to have to wait till the start of the next semester to finish your work. You don't have to wait till next fall. You can do it in the spring. Uh, you can do it in January. Uh, but you just can't do it in December to make, to make up that work. Um, th there will be opportunities to make up missed labs. But those go away at a certain date. And there will be, you have to turn your final project in by a certain date. After that, it's too late, you've missed it. Uh, so you'll just have to make it up in January and take the incomplete. It's really important in this course not to get behind, not to get lost. You, have, you should do a little work every week and you'll be fine. Do your labs. The labs are where you're really going to learn about, H, F, uh, about, the, uh, about Verilog and the hardware description languages that it represents. All right. So this other stuff was for micro students. I just, I guess I should delete it. But anyway, uh, okay. In the lab, you have to wear your mask. You can't group up. You have to stay six feet away. Uh, obviously, we may have a little slack, but we're going to try and enforce those rules and and try and stay out of trouble with the, uh, uh, you know, with the university. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, if you have a fever, don't come to lab. If you feel like you've got COVID, don't come to lab. Um, all right. Um, let's see. We so we may eventually have you signing up for labs if we have to. If we have so many people showing up at the start of lab that that they're waiting for a long time, what we'll do is, like I said, we'll divide it into two groups, and you can sign up for the first part or the second part, or or maybe we'll probably let you sign up and then first come first serve, uh, or maybe you can. Uh, maybe we'll let you divide into two groups. You can be thinking about that. If we have to do that, you can decide. Uh, and I'm okay with that. We do have a TA. Uh, you might know him. It's Alex Ibarra. He's been an undergraduate here. He just graduated. He's working on his master's, and he's going to be the TA for this course. He, will be, in, he will be in lab most of the time in lab. I'll be there some. But my plan is to do a video to help you with the labs. Uh, not for all of them, but for some of them, you will definitely need it. And I'll, I'll try and do that video and have it posted uh, before uh, by say yeah before Monday, so you can so you can review it uh, before you do the lab. The first lab will take two weeks, uh, and I'm, I'll go through that here. Let, let me go ahead and talk about that. Uh, well, let, let me go through the rest of the syllabus, and then I'll come back to that. Um, all right, let's see. Um, so there's some public health considerations. You're welcome to do these. I am a physician. If you have questions about what I think, I'm happy to tell you. Uh, I don't know a whole lot more than a lot of other folks. I have learned about the testing. Uh, one of my friends just set up a lab, so I've looked at his equipment. And, and uh, I will tell you, there is some extremely sophisticated testing equipment uh, to detect COVID virus. In fact, the way that works is they first use reverse transcriptase and change the RNA virus uh, material that's in the virus, it's all RNA, it's not DNA, they change it into DNA. And then they, uh, then they uh, sequence parts of that DNA and compare it to the DNA that, that has been identified as the virus. And if it matches, then, uh, then it's the virus. So there's two sites they use, the N1 and the N2. And you have to get a positive match on both sides to have a positive test. If you match one and not the other, they're considered indeterminate. If they're both negative, you have a negative test. And you probably only need a copy or two. You probably only need a few virus particles to have a positive result. This is truly amazing. Uh, this machine, the, at many, at this particular machine, runs uh, 300, uh, 384 tests in two hours. Just amazing. And it costs the same whether you run one test or 384. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And it costs about costs a little over 1,200 bucks to run the to run the machine. One one three hundred eighty four tests worth, uh, but at two hundred dollars a test, you can still make money on it. Okay, so anyway, you can read some of this material. Uh, you can read if you need help with face masks and uh, 
you can uh, the university I think will be providing some. Uh, there will be hand sanitizer. Uh, it's good to do your hands before and after lab. Uh, realistically, though, uh, this virus I I don't think is transmitted by uh, by touching, unless you touch some. Uh, obvious COVID contaminated surface and then you stick your finger in your nose or in your eyes or in your mouth. Uh, so just don't touch your face and you, you, you will not get it by touching a contaminated surface. Um, it's normally by inhaling an aerosol with virus particles in it. And that's why the masks are somewhat helpful. Obviously they don't filter everything out. Um, okay, uh, coming on down. Here's my contact information. It's also on Blackboard. Here's Blackboard. Uh, here's Blackboard. Uh, so there's my contact information down there, my address, my cell phone. Use this email address, paul.morton at utsa.edu. You can be all small letters or caps, doesn't matter. Uh, don't send it through the Blackboard email system. Uh, just use this address. Um, okay, and then at noon on Monday, from noon to 1, uh, this is my lab, my office hours. So I'm gonna go on Zoom and I'll sit there for an hour. Uh, these are the dates, so starting on Monday the 24th, uh, the 31st, 7th, and so forth, all the way to November 30th will be the last one. Uh, here's the link. You just take this and paste it in your browser. And I don't think there's a password. Yeah. So you just put it in, boom, and away it goes. If you have to put in the meeting ID, there it is, but I think it's included up here. There it is right there. So I think that I think you just have to do this. And I, you can come on before I get there, uh, and I'll, but I'll be there at noon. Uh, feel free any, any Monday to do that. Uh, I, the other course, students from other courses will be there from Logic Design and Micro One. So initially it won't be very busy, but when uh, people are getting crunched for their final projects in micro, it'll probably be crazy. I will schedule some extra help sessions for those guys. And when you're doing your project, I'll schedule some extra help sessions uh, for you online. And we'll also uh, maybe even work out some lab times or whatever. We'll figure it out. But, but, uh, but this is generic office hours for everybody. Uh, okay. Let's see. So moving on down. Um, if I'm in my office, it is BSC 1.538, but uh, I might I won't necessarily always do lab uh, lab hours from work. I may be home, but most of the time I'll probably be at work. Um, I don't know. I have to see. Okay, um, so communication. You may email me uh, at the Paul at utsa.edu or text me using my cell phone. Do not, uh, if you call me, I probably won't answer the phone because, um, let's see, let me pull the screen back up. Because I get a lot of uh, sales calls on my cell phone. Uh, I'm sure you do too. Uh, at least many of you do. Uh, and if I don't see the, if I don't recognize the number in my directory, I don't answer. So don't bother to call, just send me a text and tell me you need to talk to me and I'll call you back. I do check my text messages. I get a bunch of junk text messages too, but at least you can glance at those and, and ignore them or delete them or whatever. So anyway, so feel free to send the text messages. Um, and then I'll call you back. If for some reason that doesn't work, try again. If you're really in a panic, you can call me, but like I say, I may not answer. Um, uh, and you can email me too. I do check my email. I do check it every day, but sometimes I might miss a day. Uh, but usually during the semester, I'm checking it every day. But I usually don't check it much on weekends. So if you if you email me late Friday night, I may not see it till Monday sometime. Um, so if you really have to talk to me, and then you can text me. Uh, again, obviously, you know, it'd be nice if you kind of respect. You know, if you only do that if it's really crucial, right? Um, but I don't mind. It's okay. All right, and it, and usually it's a working day, so you know, so it might be. Uh, you know, if you send something Friday night, I might not get it till two. I might not check it on email till Tuesday, but I, I probably will on Monday. Um, all right. Um, so let's see. I think the book's coming up. Um, so prereq, I mean, logic design, and you should have taken a C++ course. 
you just need this uh, the digital nexus 4 board and we're gonna we have them we'll sign it out to you uh, we do want you to take care of it you can break them we've broken about 10 of them so that's two thousand dollars worth kind of sad right so try not to break them um, we want to use them for a few more semesters for sure um, all right uh, so here are the objectives topics covered uh, so we'll have we'll have uh, three lectures a week except occasionally we'll skip a Friday and we'll have one uh, three-hour lab or 165 minutes whatever that is um, but we might break that into half uh, so we'll see um, all right um, here are the performance objectives you can read through these uh, and uh, here's kind of want you to have basic computer skills want you to have a functioning laptop with a camera um, pro and not an Apple because uh, I guess some of the Macs can run Vivado a lot of students have trouble with it I know you can you can spoof Windows with a Mac and I think if you do that it might work uh, I know students have done it successfully but many students have struggled to also um, so a lot of, we'll communicate uh, through e either email text uh, uh, I'll communicate to you with email uh, and I'll send out I I'll send out a test message and uh, if you don't get it let me know there's must be some problem with your email address I don't know sometimes things get screwed up okay um, let's see so so grades we're gonna have a post video quizzes they will count for 0.2 course point, 0.2 course points. So five quizzes, that's one point. And there'll probably be 25 or 30 of them, 35 maybe even. So if you just get 25, if you get, there'll probably be three or four or five questions. If you get half the questions right, you'll get full credit. So you can miss a question or two, it's okay. Um, and if you get at least 25, you'll get the whole five points. If you get more than that, then you might get some uh, some extra credit points. Uh, I, I, one of my students from Micro uh, was over at my house last week or week before, and he was telling me that he didn't do very well on the quizzes. He really struggled with them. So I know some people have problems. Uh, open the quiz up and watch the video and answer the questions as they come up in the video. I promise I, I will only ask questions that I covered in the video. Uh, there'll be one final project. It's going to be worth at least 20 points. There will be uh, uh, 10 labs and you have to do the labs uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more the first lab you have two weeks you only have to do one report for it and uh, basically you just have to show the TA in lab that your board is doing what it's supposed to do or if you do this at home you can take a little video and show kind of the some of the final results the first lab uh, though I'll probably just have you uh, not mess with the video we'll just have you submit the the lab report at the end but this is a this is the lab it's a very nice lab I'm gonna go through it here in a minute but it it's really well let me show you while we're talking about it so it's a it's a Vivado tutorial it's put out by I don't remember if uh, Xilinx did this so Xilinx put it out but they used the Nexus 4 board to do it and it's really nice and uh, and basically they're talking about how you how you go through the process of of uh, of going from you know an idea to uh, putting the bit file down on your board um, that this would be the design flow we'll talk about design flow uh, in this course uh, there are a number of, when when you want to build an integrated circuit uh, especially uh, there's a very very spelled out design flow how how we do that with our integrated development environments using hardware description languages uh, and the reason for this is you don't want to spend the five hundred thousand dollars to set up the foundry to make a fancy chip only to find out they're they're no good because you made a mistake that's katie bar the door you're, you're losing your job probably unless you're the ceo in which case you're losing your company <laughs> so this is serious so there's a lot of uh there's a lot of uh simulation that's done and uh you can see here uh the real-time simulation the functional simulation the the timing simulation before we really get the bit file done now admittedly with the labs we're doing the synthesis times are not that long and uh 
and we're not making an integrated circuit, we're just generating a bit file and we're putting it in the FPGA and we can change it and change it as many times as we want. Uh, so it, 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 it doesn't cost us half a million dollars each time we do it. But if you're making a chip, it may not cost you that much, but it's gonna cost you a boatload of money. You do not want to screw it up. So uh, there's, there, we'll go through this, we'll talk about this in the course, but, but uh, this design flow is very important. And this is just one sort of representation of it. There's a number of ways of looking at it, but okay. So you'll see, this is what the tutorial is supposed to teach you. And then, and then this is the circuit you're gonna make. Nothing much really. You're gonna have switches here and you're gonna have a few gates and then you're gonna have LEDs that are gonna show the state of the switches. These switches, the switch turns on the LED, switch turns off the LED. Here they go through gates. So there's some logic combinations you have to consider. But that there's, you know, here we inverted the switch. Here we, you know, uh, this LED is driven by the output of this AND gate, which is this bit in, this bit inverted in. Uh, this one's by the output of these two AND gates into this OR gate, um, so forth anyway. So you'll see, uh, uh, you'll, you'll work through this, and you can see it's, it's actually very extensive. You can see as I scroll down through it, there's a lot to cover in this. And I want you to take your time. Now there'll be a few things like like here we have the uh, the schematic that's dropped out of Vivado. Uh, your schematic will not look like this because each version of Vivado has improved the schematics a little bit, and this one's actually harder to understand. The one that, the ones that are coming out now are actually better to understand. So it, it won't be identical, but it'll be very close. Uh, this tutorial is a few years old, and you'll see this is where we've. Uh, this is how the pins are used, and there's a whole bunch of stuff. Anyway, you can see there's a lot to it. You could race through it. There's the uh, there's the post synthesis, uh, the synthesized schematic. So the oh, first one was pre synthesis. This is post synthesis, and it's really interesting to see the differences. Uh, if you have pins that are disconnected from stuff, you realize your constraint file screwed up. So these these uh, these schematics are really helpful. Uh, and then then we'll do some. Uh, Here's some of the routing information or the net list. Uh, and we just go through, here's where you actually simulate the design. Uh, so this is your test bench running. Um, and, uh, and then here it is, you know, programmed on the board, I guess. Anyway, they'll tell you, they walk you through the whole process. Take your time, do every step. And you'll learn a lot about the integrated development environment. And this, this lab will really help you uh, kind of uh, see where we're going in this course. All right, so that's lab one, and we're going to take two weeks to do it because it, it does take it does take some time. So uh, maybe you can work for an hour or two in lab this week, and then you can download Vivado and work at home and uh, finish the lab up next week at home if you want uh, or whatever. Uh, but you do need to get your board, and we should have those boards ready to go. I will send out an email to everybody uh, on uh, on Monday uh, tomorrow, uh, and. Uh, Hopefully Jared, who's our who's our lab uh, lab engineer guy, he's gonna hopefully be available to pass those out. But I, I haven't gotten his schedule. Uh, I probably will have some some of the boards in lab uh, on Monday afternoon, so you can go to lab if you're assigned to lab on Monday afternoon and you can pick your board up. Uh, I will have some other boards on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, uh, and then there'll be another time you can just come in and pick it up. So if you get behind this week, don't panic. You can get the lab done. In, you know, in just in just probably a couple of hours next week. But I do want you to, to get the board and get going so we don't waste a lot of time. All right, so that's the lab. 10 labs, 25 points. Homework, 12 points. Eight homeworks that cost 1.5 each. Uh, a couple of midterms, seven points each. And one final for 24 points. And that's 100. And I just give letter grades. I don't do the pluses and minuses. Um, so we will have quizzes. Again, you just have to get 50% for them to count. If you get at least 25 quizzes uh, and half the questions right, then you'll get the full five points for the quizzes. Uh, I, I, we'll see if we can get a discussion board running. Uh, there is one on, on Blackboard that I'll try and fire up. I, I don't know, I haven't ever used it before. Uh, but uh, we will have at least one help session a week available for you. Um, and so uh, you can come to that and ask questions. Uh, let's see. Um, there won't be a group presentation. There'll be a final project. I, I should fix that. It's kind of screwed up. 
Um, turn in your homework on time. You can turn it in up to one week late, you'll get 50% credit. But uh, after that, you get no credit. I'm not going to accept any late homework. I'm not get, we're just not going to do things late. We're going to do them on time this semester. Uh, last spring, I made lots of exceptions. Not going to do it this semester. We're, it's going to be, uh, we're going to run this ship tight because I know if I do that, it'll motivate you to get your work done on time. Um, so do it on time. Don't lose credit. Uh, it's better for you to have, you know, 80% uh, of the homework done and turn it on time than it is to have 100% done and turn it in late or to have 100% done and try and turn it in more than a week late and not be able to. Uh, so just do what you can and turn it in. All you got to do is get 50% to get full credit. Um, I do want you to turn in legible work. Uh, on Blackboard, you will turn in your homework, .doc or .pdfs. That's it. No other, no other document will be accepted. So don't, don't scan it as a JPEG and try and turn that in. Scan it as a JPEG, paste the JPEG into your doc, document, and, uh, and then format it so it doesn't look too bad. Maybe even type in some lines to explain what it is. Put in your name so it's legible. Uh, all those things really help uh, our grader get them graded. And, and our, our TA is going to be super busy. I hope they give us a grader. Um, all right. Uh, I will try and keep the, keep, the, keep the grade book on Blackboard up to date, but I'm somewhat constrained by how the TA does getting things posted. And uh, so we'll see. But, but when you get to midterm, you will get a midterm grade. So you'll sort of know how you're doing. Um, all right. Um, we talked about late work. Nothing after you can turn it in after a week late. For labs, you, let's say you do the lab this Monday. Uh, well, this is a two-week lab anyway. So you would have this week, next week, and, and then you'd have all the way to the Saturday of the next week. But Saturday at midnight of the next week, that's the last opportunity to turn in the lab from this, uh, the, the lab stuff from this week. Um, well, yeah, basically. All right, there will be some extra credit opportunities. Um, I need to fix this. This is some of this is was set up for logic design, so you don't take it too literally. Um, yeah, we won't be doing a group project. We'll be doing a final project. Um, okay. And there's, there's all sorts of resources here. Any of these blue things you can click on and uh, uh, you can control click on it and, uh, and it'll open up uh, uh, in, the, in your browser and you can get some help. There's a, you know, there's a COVID team, there's an ombudsman, um, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, okay, they even threw in the parking policies. No, I guess other policies, uh, whatever. Okay, and the Roadrunner Creed and the Crest. Okay, so here's the schedule. So uh, I, this might change, but this is what we're planning. Now you'll notice uh, on Wednesday, I'm gonna I'll set up the prereq test. Right now it's not in an online format, but I'll make it online format so you can do it online. Uh, it's uh, all the online stuff will be automatically graded. Uh, there, there's no uh, there's no credit for the prereq test, so there's it's totally low threat. You can't get hurt by it. It just it's required by ABET, so that's one reason. It also helps me kind of know kind of where you are, and uh, and since we are going to use uh, what you learned in logic design, I, I will have some I'll have some review questions for logic design. I have some re, some questions that tell me about your knowledge of uh, uh, of C plus plus. I forget. Uh, there's a couple of a uh, couple of items on it. Uh, okay, um, and then we're going to start in. Uh, uh, we're going to start then. Uh, well, I probably won't talk about this today, but we'll start in chapter two. We're not going to start in chapter one because chapter one is a review of logic design, and I'm going to cover chapter two first because I want to uh, get you in the mode of learning of. Uh, 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 very log right off the bat and then once we cover all of chapter two uh, then we'll we'll start doing some logic uh, design review and we'll take a one of the midterms will be a test over logic design so it's kind of a review of logic design 
And we'll, we'll do that in what, one, two, three, four, five videos, and then you'll take a test. Uh, so so all right, right off the bat, we're gonna start talking about Verilog. And if I have time tonight, we'll, we'll start on a little bit, although uh, we may not. Okay, we're at 35 minutes now, so we probably won't have a lot of time. Okay, and then once we do, once we do that, then we'll go on to chapter three, chapter four, five, and we will cover, uh, we'll cover all 10 chapters in the book, or yeah. Then once we finish the book, there's some special topics we'll also cover, assuming that we have time. Uh, and those are scheduled as well. So I scheduled all the periods, but like I say, some of them, we may get through some of this a little faster and we may combine some, some days. And so some of the Fridays we may not have a video. Um, so we will do final projects and we'll talk about those and we will do a, we'll do a test two coming down here. Well, I guess I've baselined three midterms, uh, the logic design review test uh, up here and then test one theory, test two. I may only do a second midterm. We, I think we'll only do two, two tests, not three. Uh, but in any event, if I do, I'll decrease. It'll still just be uh, 14 points total for the midterms. So they'll, their value of each one will drop a little bit, make it a little easier on you. Okay, uh, we will do a final. I, I don't know if it'll be in person or online. I think it will be online, and uh, we'll, I'll probably, we'll probably do it during the scheduled final exam period. Um, I might schedule it earlier, uh, maybe maybe in that last week of classes and not cover any of these special topics on the final. Uh, we'll see. We'll talk about that and I'll, I'll see how you feel. Here's a list of the labs. Well, just by lab one. Um, so two weeks on lab one and then we'll do, we'll have a week for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And because this time uh, the Labor Day is going to fall in here, but since you can do them from home, it you, we will miss that Monday lab period. Uh, we'll just sort of work around it. Uh, if you really have a problem with it, then let me know, and we'll we'll work something out. But um, and you can always you you know if you didn't make Monday, uh, then we can maybe work a different day or something. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But uh, that may be a little bit of a wrinkle. Uh, normally, I do two weeks here because we do miss that Monday, but unfortunately. Uh, 31st is Monday, and and Labor Day is the is the uh, is the seventh. So so we will miss Labor Day the week of Lab Two. So ideally, what you should do is is if you're in the Monday group, uh, get on your lab right off the box this Monday, and next week you can start on Lab Two if you're coming to Lab. Uh, if you're doing it from home, then Labor Day doesn't matter. You can work on it Labor Day at home. Okay, so those are the labs, and that's the schedule. Um, and uh, they, um, I, they're not necessarily, um, they're all written and done, but I may go back and change a few of them for this semester to make them uh, more interesting. I'm always trying to, to do that each semester. So we'll see, I'll probably, I'll probably modify a few this semester. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, all right, so, um, so here's the website down here. It, are, is the lab thing? Here's the syllabus, labs, powerpoints. I'll, I'll, the powerpoints are pretty up to date, I think. Um, homework, and I'll try. Right now, the homework turn-in links are all screwed up, but I'll try and fix all those and get the right dates assigned. They are. Uh, they do show up in the syllabus, uh, in that schedule that we just looked at. Um, uh, it's it's a little, just like they did in logic design. It's you know tilde h dash one would be the, the date you'd have to turn in lab one and so forth, uh, or h tilde one I guess. Okay, um, and then a few other things. Well, most of those you can't see right now. All right. Um, so let's see. I think that's largely what I wanted to cover. So we're right at coming up on forty minutes. So I, I'm probably, I'm probably not gonna, probably not gonna cover too much else. Maybe I'll bring up chapter two. Now let me do that real quick. I'll bring up chapter two and we'll, we'll see. We'll do maybe just a few minutes.
and we'll pick up on this on even though uh, so I'll probably go ahead and uh, you're gonna do the the prereq test hopefully Wednesday but I may I may even post a video Wednesday that you can also look at we'll see but I may not but I'll for sure post one on Friday so we'll pick up with this on Wednesday or Friday but let me let me go ahead and uh, and do this and we'll all right introduction to Verilog so uh, and this is the lab schedule uh, again uh, there's up to 30 scheduled but we're only allowing uh, we're only allowing uh, 14 um, you can definitely swap with other students uh, but you can't we won't you can't jam in this time only 14 students in the lab and the TA will enforce that and you have to wear a mask you have to socially distance okay and you can only miss one lab all right um, so uh, lab assignments will be on blackboard uh, so you can definitely do the lab at home but don't copy someone else's work do your own and I, I just can't stress this enough it's not gonna it's not gonna hurt it doesn't really hurt me when you cheat yourself out of the learning opportunity uh, so I really encourage you to do your own work uh, it's really I think super important that you do that all right but um, all right, um, there will be a lab sheet to turn in. Uh, the demo, uh, we'll tell you what days we want you to take a, a short video of your demo and, and uh, post it on Blackboard. Uh, sometimes just turning in the sheet will be enough. Sometimes we do want you to show us the demo. Uh, you don't have to be present in lab. Lab will be, lab is, uh, lab is there primarily for folks that, that are having trouble getting it done at home. Um, all right. And most of the labs are short enough that you can you can experiment and do other things once you get your the, the required work done. Um, okay, so how do we get digital devices? Uh, we either make a new very large scale integrated circuit, uh, or we program an FPGA, or maybe a smaller programmable logic device like a complex program like a CPLD. Uh, they're really the programmable logic things other than the the CPLDs don't really exist anymore so what we're, what we're really talking about is primarily FPGAs for a, for a, a little operation you might there still are CPLDs called complex programmable logic devices available but uh, but they're uh, and they're still used but 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 the most of the, the focus uh, is going to be on FPGAs and that's really that's you're going to see this just more and more part of almost every product that's out there unless it's super super simple um, when we make chips we really we there's really two different ways we can do this one is where you just make a new chip from scratch and we'll often uh, so that's just a that's just a de novo chip uh, from the ground up there's also a thing called an application specific integrated circuit and the way this works it is a it is an integrated circuit that's been partially manufactured but not completely it's uh, the wafer is is finished and it has all these basic logic gates on it that you can hook together in some various ways to create your specific set of hardware and and some of these are really big chips with lots and lots and lots of available gates to be hooked up so you can virtually do anything with these chips but the final processing step has to do with putting a metallized layer on top that connects these this this field of gates you know thousands and thousands of maybe hundreds several hundred thousand uh, maybe more than that maybe a million uh, and you can you can design this this metalized layer to connect them up in just such a way that it implements your specific logic, uh, and then brings them out on various pins and and uh, and then you have essentially a custom made chip. Now, this is this this all has to be done at a foundry, and this all has to be scheduled. And you know if you're ordering one of these chips and you don't have that foundry, uh, then you're 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 hostage to their schedule so 
So there's a long lead time on these, uh, on these ch on new chips and on application-specific integrated circuits. But if you want to get something done fast, you can buy an FPGA, get it shipped out, get it tomorrow or the next day, and then you can program it and boom, your design is implemented. And that's one of the beauties of FPGAs. Uh, you, can, you can get your design done uh, as soon as you finish your code. You don't have to go through the process of making a brand new chip. The downside is because of the because of of the fact that these 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 FPGAs have the ability to be programmed with uh, with a bit file, essentially software, to create the hardware you want. The fact that 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 all that capability is built into the chip makes the chip probably twice the size it would otherwise be. And it throws a monkey wrench in your ability to control the timing very, very uh, carefully. You lose some control because the synthesizer is making uh, a bunch of decisions for you. And although you do have uh, some limited visibility into that and impact on that, you, you don't really get a change at all that much. The synthesizer just has to do its thing. You can, can, you can provide some guidance on the, some of the critical timing paths, but most of the time, you, you're, if, if you don't get timing closure, you've really got to go back and scratch your head and figure out. You got it take It's a lot of work to fix those problems on an FPGA. Whereas on an application-specific integrated circuit or a brand new integrated circuit, you have a lot of control over the timing pathways. And because the chips, for the same amount of logic in the end, the chips are much denser because you don't have all this programming uh, uh, hardware built in, you have you gain total control of your timing and you move all the components closer together so there's less unpredictability in the in the pathways and the timing associated with delays in the pathways. So so there's some real advantages and some real disadvantages in doing custom chips or our application specific integrated circuits, so called ASICs. So with a custom chip or an ASIC you you and and not and not to mention the cost is dramatically greater. Uh, the uh, the the FPGA might be a little pricey, but um, so if you're doing small volume though, it's going to save you a bundle because your first the custom chip uh, that comes out of the foundry is going to cost you I don't know maybe several hundred thousand dollars, whereas your first FPGA. Uh, Worst case, it might cost you 1200 bucks, And that's for the cutting edge, state-of-the-art, latest one off the assembly line. If you get a more uh, pedestrian chip, one that's been around for a little while, like, like the one you're using, uh, it's been around for three or four years, three years maybe, uh, you're, you're going to pay maybe, you know, 50 bucks or maybe even less than that, maybe, maybe 10 or 20 So that's a lot cheaper than half a million dollars. Uh, so there, but if you're going to make... Um, you know, if you're going to make 700,000 of them, ah, then your cost per chip starts to drop. <coughs> and you may be way ahead of the game to do a custom chip or an ASIC under those circumstances. But if you're only going to sell maybe 300, probably should do an FPGA if you can get that to work. And you probably can because they're very powerful and they're very fast and they're built with, you know, the latest uh, 10 nanometer, 7 nanometer technologies. Uh, they're they're right up there with the cutting edge, but you may have some nightmares with the timing. All right, so um, we'll cover this slide and then we'll quit. So so the uh, so this is this is kind of uh, this is how the fab works. Okay, so you you basically type in your VHDL. Or your, or your Verilog, hardware description language. You're, you're using uh, Cadence or Mentor Graphics, one of those big programs. And uh, once you get everything done and you've done all the validation, the simulation, run the test benches, uh, pre-synthesis uh, simulations, post-synthesis simulations, uh, timing, timing simulations, you've gotten sign-offs from all the, all the bosses for all the sims and all the all the timing closure and all you know all the functional testing and you're and and you're 
design is mature and signed off so you have very high confidence it's going to work out of the box. Then you hit the button, the synthesizer churns and wheezes and churns and spits out these very expensive uh, 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 photo masks. They're very thick, they're really heavy, they probably weigh about 20 pounds each. Uh, they're thick glass and I don't even know how they do it but they're doing 10 nanometer feature size with light that's on the wavelength of, uh, of several hundred nanometers or maybe even a thousand nanometers. I mean it's crazy. Yellow like is 5500 nanometers, right? So infrared might get might get uh, down to 800 nanometers but I mean still we're talking uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what they use exactly but it's really pretty impressive how they can somehow get these features using these photo masks with with light that has wavelengths way in excess of the features they're trying to get. Um, and they have games they play to do this. Uh, they normally, you might think if they have a, a wafer, well so first off they get they get some electronic grade sand, they melt it and then they grow a, a, a crystal. These crystals are humongous. Uh, they weigh maybe uh, you know 200 pounds. They're really big. and. Uh, and they they pull them out of this molten uh, silicon, and and then they slice them very finely and polish them like crazy, and then they put certain uh, deposit certain stuff on them. Then what they do is they uh, they for each layer they're doing, uh, sometimes they'll etch, sometimes they'll dope, sometimes they'll center on metal, sometimes they'll do I don't know. They have a zillion different types of steps, but each step is basically based on the idea. Of exposing this photo mask, uh, shining light through the photo mask, covering the the wafer with photoresist. Um, the photo mask exposes some of the photoresist uh, that hardens and stays, and some of it doesn't and gets washed off. And that puts a pattern on this little on this wafer. And then they then they expose it to uh, to either a process that etches away some of the silicon that grows new uh, epitaxial silicon onto the uncoated areas. Uh, they are dope some of the areas with P or N type doping or whatever they use. Um, and then they go through this process uh, many times. So the number of photo masks to make a single chip could be quite extensive. And when they do these, they don't expose the whole, the photo mask doesn't do the whole wafer at once. It's moved, it's indexed along. Usually it just has one, uh, one uh, the one part on it and there might be a hundred of these built onto this one wafer. So it may be stepped through and done a hundred times. It's just amazing. Um, and then uh, then they take the final wafer with all the all the parts on it fully formed they and they cut it into little pieces and then they uh, and then once they get that done they'll put it onto a, a carrier. In this case it's a through hole and they'll tight they'll attach very 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 fine bonding wires to these to these metal legs and a lot of times they, they attach the bonding wires uh, using uh, a vibration uh, technology where they just vibrate it real fast because it's so thin it it heats up and melts and melts onto the little uh, silicon uh, uh, the, the, the metalized contact point on the die and and in the case of an FPGA the chip we're using uh, is about the size of a po it's smaller than a big than a normal postage stamp. Uh, when you get your board, you can look at it, and it has 324 pins. And you, and you go, how do you get 324 pins on one of these things? Well, they they don't put little legs on them like this. Uh, these have what are called ball grid arrays, and they have little solder dots on the back side, where underneath the chip, and the chip is precisely placed on the board with a pick and place machine. And there's a little dot of solder paste on underneath each solder ball, and then when they send it to the reflow oven, it it solders all those points, heats everything up to maybe uh, 200 degrees centigrade or 250 centigrade, or maybe more, and uh, and to inspect these, they have to take X-rays to see them, and and some of these parts are so expensive that if they miss something, they'll take them off and they'll 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 do what's called reball the uh, the grid array. And, uh, and they'll put the little solder balls back on it and they'll reuse the chip until they get it on right. It's truly amazing. 
So let's see. Um, that's the size of a FPGA. You can see here's a here's an Ethernet plug-in here. Um, so you can see these are dip sockets there. So you can see this is this is this is the size. And notice you don't see any pins. It's because it's a ball grid array. This is not the board we'll be using. It's just a different one. All right. So this is homework one. Uh, it's in this first. Uh, it's also under the homework list. But you can pull it up uh, on this. And this I think this. Uh, uh, and I, I may talk a little bit about this Friday, but I'm, I'm going to wrap the video up. Um, so I will do a little quiz uh, after this video. Uh, and so there'll be a little quiz to take.